raid floated past and so had the evisceration of 12 million bucks. Conducted and calculated by the state of New York to cause a stir of camaraderie, whose volume of sound was matched only in deep space, found itself the performers only to the remaining rodents, loitering the sidewalk, scavenging for deconstructed trolley food. While an assortment of barely conscious, coffee-deprived opinion makers conversed and shuffled their ways to the cafes of the high-rises like the workmen to the docks, I instead found by the clock tower standing vis-a-vis and leaning by the door frame with a nonchalant attitude. None other than a porky friend of mine from college, Mark Goldstein. Goldstein, who I remembered from our years frequenting the underground bars and cultural quarters, could fix a windmill on an old Dutch painting and sell a beaten up television back to the guys it seems. Did you read the New York Times article on the mayor's jacket? He asked, flicking a cigarette to the ground and shaking my hand. I thought the mayor was quite depicted, smartly dressed in his jackets. We're talking about the same guy, aren't we? I replied. It's not to do with jackets. It's about his abundance of them. Can you be arrested on charges of shopping too much? I asked. Sure you can. It's all about where the money came from and all shit like that, Goldstein said. While I had been emerging as a struggling playwright in the cafes of Broadway, Goldstein had taken up an apprenticeship with a clock company on 46th Street. Made quite a nice sum for himself, fixing timepieces, though he never did wear one, which was quite odd. Could buy yourself a new suit with that kind of dough, I said, poking Mark in the shoulder. The clock tower on 346 Broadway chimed its time ordering Mark to complete his work. Nothing short of the Hindenburg flying overhead could stop me from taking up Goldstein's offer to see the top. I looked up, nothing. Mark called the old service elevator by use of a turn switch on the wall that made a loud clanging and clicking sound. Was this elevator here when the building was built? I asked, make, while the grating case around us jolted into play. Before then, I believe, they build these buildings around them, he answered. Must have looked almighty odd, I thought. A building site with nothing but an old service elevator inside of it. Or maybe it was a new service elevator at the time. A thought for another day, perhaps. The city swooped further and further from us below and flashing like an old camera through the windows. I had managed to time my blinking with a shutter as to not deter, as to deter from rapturing my cornea on the sunset. Where is it the mayor lives? I blurted out over the rumbling of chains and shaking of wired death bus. I believe he stays in the mayor's office, Goldstein replied sarcastically. But specifically, I don't know. He adjusted his tool belt and protruded from his pants pocket a packet of Marlboro cigarettes, to which he gave a jolt and suspended one from his lips. No smoking, I said, tapping a sign. I'm not smoking. I'm merely holding it in my lips for future use. Not late yet. I believe the mayor uses some of these loopholes, I mean. The cafe from which I had written my latest catastrophe failure of a story passed through one of the snapshot windows. We eventually halted at the top, being swept up by at first the smell of old grease, then adjusting our eyes to match the dim orange glow inside the faces of New York's wristwatches. Goldstein retreated to a workbench by the east face and slumped down, finally lighting his cigarette. He waved out the match and asked, what you think, through gritted teeth. Well, it's not the Ritz. Is that a pickle sandwich? I asked, pointing at his tool bag. Take it, my hour's over, Goldstein replied, throwing the delicatessen the light my way with a few of the pickles falling out. We each eviscerated our meals with great force and with quite quick timing for myself as I was sitting by the largest of the three bells. This whole place is mine for the day, Goldstein railed like the king in his castle. Lucky you. 
I have to buy a cup of Joe an hour to stay in my seat. You get yours paid for. I said, deconstructing my mysterious meat from the pickle. Not quite. Do try 25 cents in a machine downstairs, the mechanic added, getting his tools out and continuing some mysterious ritual. Try $1.25 and a waitress who would throw it in your face if her job didn't depend on it. I said, where'd you get this schlock from? The sandwich crumpled and seeped into the floorboards below. Um, a trolley run by a lady called Dolly. I only remember that because it rhymed, Mark added, taking off parts from a metal grid and placing some back while I ate what little of the suicidal sandwich I still had in my hands. Before he added, maybe that could be a story for you. What? A trolley seller called Dolly. Could be like a streetcar named Desire type of crap. How much did you pay for one of Dolly's sandwiches, I asked. I gave her a ten, she gave me back four ones, so six. Geez, oh, I could have bought one of the mayor's jackets for that. And have changed for a coffee, maybe two. Protruding a clipping of paper from my pants pockets and a pencil from behind my tortoise shell glasses, I wrote down the events Goldstein had prepared for me. It was crap, but somewhat credible crap. I scurried over to the north face, jerking open a latch by the initials VII, while gently swinging open the glass pane and checking the face against my watch. Slow by one minute.